actual immune system is bolstered by going out to nature. The meditative state is actually sort of being really engaged and being present. So the mindfulness piece comes into play for me. For people that travel, you know, we talk about garden tourism. I mean, you know, the stress of traveling and the, why not visit a garden? From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer. I'm Marissa Lennox. Now, before we get started, I would like to welcome our remote audience who are engaging with us for the first time on an episode of The Zoomer. We are so thrilled to have you here. It's great to see your beautiful faces. And before long, you'll be back in studio. I'm sure of it. Uh, 2022 has been proclaimed the year of the garden for the 100th anniversary of Canada's horticulture industry. To mark this milestone, we've devoted today's show to all things gardening. After all, it is one of the healthiest hobbies you can develop. On today's show, the many healthful benefits of gardening, plus tips to prepare your outdoor space for the fall and next summer. And later, a story of a cancer survivor who found hope and healing through gardening. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. They say gardening adds years to your life and life to your years. And Canadians agree, as renewed interest in gardening has bloomed. According to a new study, four in five Canadians expect to spend the same or more time in nature this year. While at least 12% are taking it up for the first time. Over 9 in 10 Canadians believe that gardening improves quality of life and boosts physical and mental health. While over 80% note its positive impact on the environment. For these reasons and more, Canadians want to celebrate Canada's garden culture and favour designating 2022 as the Year of the Garden. For the 100th anniversary of Canada's horticulture industry. Michelle, let me start with you. How did the Year of the Garden come about and why is it so important that we celebrate it? We realized that 2022 was gonna be the centennial of the Canadian horticultural, uh, ornamental horticultural sector coming together. Um, and so we thought like, we need to celebrate this. So, you know, we said, how could we celebrate this? And so we put a team together and we came up with the idea that why not proclaim 2022 the year of the garden and organize a huge celebration from coast to coast to really highlight how gardens and gardening have really are really part of our lives of our canadian lives and so that's how we started it and it's not just the garden family coming together i mean this has been recognized in the house of commons of course so we proclaimed it and as uh, as the garden family and then the canadian government through the house of commons also recognized that 2022 was going to be the year of the garden in canada and so we're very happy about that and right now everybody is getting organized and we want people to participate now charlie we just saw in the kinetic there's been an uptick in people gardening over the co course of COVID. how have you seen gardening evolve over the last year well, people have been at home a lot more, right? And being at home, they've had time, and it's, and it's honestly been a time of reflection for everybody because we've had much more time on our hands. We're not rushing around, we're not sitting in traffic, we're not doing all the things we used to do. And I think that that really, that reflective time, that home time, that looking out the window time, got people stepping outside and got them getting out there and saying, oh, I should pull that weed, I should prune that bush, I should plant something in that empty hole there. And before you knew it, Sales on seeds, sales on plants had just gone through the roof. This is two springs in a row where the growers cannot keep plants in stock. Uh, they, you know, they're just running like crazy people trying to support all the hobby gardeners who have suddenly emerged from not having been hobby gardeners in the past. Yeah, that's right. No, and you know, obviously, Michelle, you and I were talking earlier. We talk about Canada's garden culture. Describe it for me and how it's evolved over the years. Well, you know, you can go back to the First Nations, they lived with plants and gardening wasn't the thing. They were living with plants. And then the Europeans arrived and they set up the first garden in 1605 in Annapolis Royal. So the garden culture, the European garden culture arrived. And then the immigrants came and all waves of immigration brought their garden 
traditions with them. And so today in Canada, we have this rich garden culture. But the fact is, it's evolving. It's still evolving because as uh, Charlie was saying, now we have young people that are getting into the garden. And so it used to be very ornamental, the beauty, the flower. Now it's about the edible garden. It's about the balcony garden. It's about, you know, we're growing cannabis, you know, and, and it's kind of, it's changing and it's evolving and it's becoming part of our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And this is what the pandemic also very much profiled. Now I know Jackie, gardening is extremely important to you. Why is it important to celebrate Canada's garden heritage? Oh, just because it's it's a it's a pastime, but it's you know you can be so involved. It can create mindfulness. It's it's so many levels. It's so many avenues, and it involves the whole families. Um, you know, various abilities. Gardening is just you know most people refer to it as the happy place. Um, and if you've never experienced that, if you start to get into it, you're going to see it, it can be the happy place through you know the food that it provides for your kitchen, the beauty that it provides the activity to go outside, to get the kids involved, and more people are out in outdoor spaces just enjoying them. Michelle, a few seconds left. How can people get involved in this initiative? So first thing is if you have a garden, you can sign it up as a celebration guard, a year of the garden celebration guard. And then we're going to be going out all the time asking you to take part, plant uh, this, the, you know, the official peony flower, plant the official tulip. We want you to also tell us how you are living the garden culture. And so the more, we're gonna launch a major national consumer marketing campaign at the end of December, and we will invite all Canadians to participate through social media, and in your garden, of course, with your hands in the soil. <laughs> I love it. All right, when we come back, fall is the perfect time to plant bulbs, perennials, and more before winter sets in. We'll show you how next. Okay, I'm gonna show you, both of you, a tip. Okay. okay. Square pot round root balls. You can reshape the root ball. Welcome back. Well, fall is the perfect time to plant bulbs, perennials, and more before winter sets in. Charlie and Michelle are here with what to plant and how so that those new plants get off to a stronger start next spring. Charlie, you know, my first question is why, what is it about the fall that makes it the perfect time to plant tulip bulbs and hyacinth bulbs? Yeah, so I've brought a bunch with me. And of course, they need a cold period in order for the flower buds to form. That's counterintuitive for me. I mean, you think yeah. that you plant in the spring and... Well, you'd be surprised how many people buy these little packages of bulbs and then forget them, and then in January realize they haven't planted them yet. Right. So that can be... A, so get them planted as soon as you buy them is kind of the first rule. Okay, and what's the, what's the, what are the tricks to making sure we're rewarded with beautiful colors in the spring? Well, choose some that you love. Okay. Here's a pretty fun one. This is a mix of red and white tulips called uh, Canada A. Uh, so I just thought I'd start with that. What we're doing is a little bit different here is we are going to plant into a planter. The biggest bulbs are going to go on the bottom layer, kind of like a lasagna. I'm going to layer in more soil, medium-sized bulbs, more soil, little bulbs on the top. When we plant bulbs, okay, number one rule, pointy end up. Good to know. Always pointy end up, whatever the bulb is, and that's an obvious one with the tulip. Uh, so I'll be planting those in there, but um, this will be very cool because next spring, you take it home, water it thoroughly. Next spring, it will start to bloom with the small ones on the surface first. So you get little grape hyacinths, then real hyacinths, then daffodils and tulips, and it'll just be a wave of flowers that will go on for a couple of weeks. All right, well, let's get our hands dirty. Yeah. Uh, floor director, Daria, is going to come in, help us out a little bit. Yes. I do have to ask, though, what is the trick to making sure squirrels don't eat these? It's not easy. I always try to distract the squirrels while I'm planting so they don't <laughs> see that I'm planting. Like, throw some peanuts on the other side of the yard and then quickly plant so that they don't see it. That, uh, uh, even the forks, the plastic forks, break off okay. the handles, stick them into the soil with the tines up under the surface. Under the surface. And right, then so they go to them. dig. Yeah, we don't see them, but they go to dig and then they run into all those little forks and they walk away. You know, squirrels don't like daffodil. That's the one bulb they don't like. So maybe you want to put in a few daffodils here and there. I and... didn't know that. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. Now, the year of the garden also comes with its very own tulip. Yes, of course. So Vessies, which uh, people might have ordered from, so they're launching an official year of the garden tulip. And so next fall, 
you will be able to buy it. Not this fall, not yet. But next spring at the Canadian Tulip Festival, National Capital Commission will be displaying the year of the Garden Tulip so people can see it and then they can get their own. You know, you are so fascinating because you have managed 16 tulip festivals. Yes, in Ottawa. You also yeah. have an even more <laughs> impressive resume than that. What is it about tulips that you love so much? Well, it, you know, it's the flower of friendship. You know, it's the flower that's traveled the world. It's the flower that brings people. And as you know, the Dutch offered us tulip bulbs for our role in liberating the Netherlands. So it's a very you know, cultural, very emotional thing. And so, yes, I love tulips. Well, speaking of tulips, okay. let's see. I mean, how are we doing over here, Charlie? Well, so we've just planted in the daffodils and the hyacinths. None of the bulbs are touching each other. We could be planting these into the ground, just like we're doing right. a garden here now. But what's neat about this is it's mobile because you can put it anywhere you want. So, yeah. you know, the hyacinths are great because they are fragrant. It's one of my most favorite bulbs in the whole world. And of course, they come in pinks and blues and whites and every almost every color of the rainbow. Our final layer will be grape muscari, mm -hmm. grape hyacinth. Yes, the bulbs have gotten smaller yeah, as yeah. we worked up, yeah. right? The biggest are at the bottom, medium and tiny. So pointy end up, roots down. And we're just gonna gently sort of pop them all over the place and put another layer of soil. Well, you know what? I'll come back to you in the spring. I'll be sending you photos. That's great. <laughs> I want to see that. Um, okay, so now in the meantime, Michelle and I are going to get our hands dirty. Yes. I don't know how this is going to turn out, I but... I brought you a project. Yeah. Okay. So each of you have a planter, yeah. and they've pre-filled them with some of our wonderful Pro Mix, excellent potting mix for what we are doing here today. Each of you have what we call the thriller. So that's the, the main focus of the, of the plant, or usually the biggest focal point plant. So this is for, our, this is for a beautiful fall display. Yeah. For the Amazon drivers, yeah. for or, yeah, never <laughs> whoever think, comes to your house. Or maybe you might have a Thanksgiving you know, family yeah. event. So with the, the thriller, it could go in the center, or in this case, I'd probably bring it to the back of okay. the pot. So take that out of okay. the pot. See how root bound that is? Mm -hmm. This, because it's fall, and these are annual plants, they are gonna die in the winter. If these were perennial plants or it was spring, we would very much want to roughen, like open these roots up because right now they're growing in a spiral, right? So we would get out a little knife, we'd start chopping the roots to make sure that this plant survives for a fair amount of time. But frankly, it's, you know, September, it's only gonna last another okay. six weeks or so. A little more soil, actually, we wanna bring the soil level of the up pot, there? Just to the to lip the, of the pot. Okay. okay. Yeah, and you in. can dump more soil in there because we got to cover those. Sweet. It smells so good. I know, eh? This is a in the mood. good soil, and this is from Premier Tech, which is a founding sponsor of the Year of the Garden. Yeah. I'm happy to say that. Love, <laughs> Love that sponsorship, right? Yes, Couldn't do yes, anything yes, without yes, sponsors. That's right. Now, you've got some other annuals okay. to play with. The salvia is that peachy colored one, if you like the looks of that. I do. All right, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna show you, both of you, a tip. Okay. okay. Square pot, round root balls. You can reshape the root ball, oh, right? So yeah. just with your hands, yeah, I'm not doing yeah. any so damage. I'm gently squeezing yeah. that root ball. So you can, see how it's now oblong, it's yeah. not round? Yes. Why would you want to do that? Because you want to pack you, it in really you tight. You want to fit it. it. We want to go right in here, because we're gonna fill this planter right up. Yeah, so this, I mentioned this was the, the thriller, the big grass. You're gonna mm -hmm. need more soil probably in there again. And we've got the filler, and the little pepper is a filler, and the salvia is also a filler. And the blue flowers are called fan flower or scavola, and they will be your um, spiller. So thriller, filler, spiller. And Charlie, yeah. you know, Scott's is also a founding partner of us, and so they must have some great fertilizer and, and yeah, to, they do. to help this yeah. out, right? That's right. How do I keep this looking beautiful for as long as possible? Well, when yes. I, when I plant planters, because I'm a very lazy gardener. <laughs> I, I, doubt, I highly doubt that. Uh, I, yeah. I look for always the easiest way to do things. I, um, I use a slow release fertilizer and Scott's makes one. So it's a um, adding just as you're planting and then you don't need to fertilize for up to four months uh, later. This is the nice thing about these planters, I mean, there's no formula to making it look beautiful. You have the most beautiful flowers and you just, you fill it. That's right. And so there I was shopping and sort of walking around and saying, okay, this is a nice idea. I, this looks nice with this. And I, yeah. But Michelle, isn't there a color recommendation for the year of the garden? Yes. In fact, one of the things we're going to be doing is inviting people to plant red. Red. Right. Oh. Red to show your Canadian garden pride. No, this nice looks great. Looking. All right, so then it's then we you know fiddle around, get them sort of oriented, and don't be afraid to end up with your 
your flowers kind of spilling out. You can always put the little root ball on an angle and have your, your fillers and your thrillers start to uh, do that growing down. All right, Charlie, Michelle, thank you. When we come back, new research on the healing power of gardening. Don't go away. There was a recognition quite many years ago that people who lived closer to nature, within two kilometers of a green space, lived longer than people that did not. Garden bathing is a kind of a new experience we can offer visitors, not just here, but if we can prove that gardens are good for you and your soul, then why isn't every Canadian in a garden every weekend? I think it's a healing space. Can we measure yours and my reaction to that space? We think we can. This is really fascinating. Gardens will become not just places to see, but also places where your soul can be restored, where your health can be reinvigorated, where you can kind of reconnect to nature. Welcome back. That was a clip from a new 10-part documentary series, Healing Gardens, hosted by our own Charlie Dobbin, coming to Vision TV in 2022. The new series explores the healing capabilities of gardens and gardening and the transformative power of plants. Now, Charlie, in that last clip, Alexander Reeford of Reeford Gardens mm -hmm. spoke about the ability to measure people's reactions to being in nature. In fact, that whole episode actually asks the question, is nature curative? Mm -hmm. So... I'm going to ask you, I mean, you have both anecdotal experience as well as you know, research to yeah. back this up. What is your impression? There's more and more science on this. There's been, a, it's interesting. I mean, I think it kind of started in Japan with the idea of, there was a recognition quite many years ago that people who lived closer to nature within two kilometers of a green space lived longer than people that did not. They, and so there was multi, you know, they had fewer heart conditions. There was fewer um, sort of chronic diseases amongst people who lived within a two kilometer range of a park or a forest or a ravine or something green. So that, and that was years ago. So that was when the forest bathing idea kind of started. I think it was a recognition by the medical community that if people with chronic conditions, um, anxiety, I mean, mental health issues, physical issues can get into nature, they will feel better. Since then, we've learned that your actual immune system is bolstered by going out to nature. Um, and there's aerosols that come off of trees, particularly evergreen trees. We can't see them. They're in the air, but we're breathing them in. And they're absorbed into our body. That's right. And it's doing magical things to heal us. It's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It's, it's fascinating uh, is the right word. Jackie, you have gone on record to say that you would not be here if not for your garden. Would you share your story with us? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, for me, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and uh, I had the surgery and I had to have a mastectomy and it was it was uh, stage zero and uh, I was home. And the the sort of the, the shock of going in, you know, within a short timeline, within two weeks, I sort of had this diagnosis and I didn't know what was going to happen. And then the shock of going to sleep and, and waking up with my breasts removed and just sort of, you know, the traumatic you know, piece of that, I thought, okay, how am I going to sort of navigate and focus and, and get back? And, you know, I'm a gardener by, by nature and I've, I've grown up with it. And then sort of as I started to heal, as I started the healing journey, I would go out to my garden every single day and it really did sort of bring me back the analogies I could make on life, the hope that it gave me when I saw, you know, in the spring things started to shoot up and I could see, okay, I know what this is like. It's regrowth. And when I thought about, you know, the weeding in the garden, the pruning in the garden, how I had to prune my breast off um, so that I would be healthier and so that I'd be better. All of a sudden, I started to make these analogies with the garden. And I would go out every day welcoming the chance that I'm going to get back into the garden to do whatever little I could at whatever stage of my healing. But it was sort of this, it always kept me going. And I would see the new growth going, uh, coming out. I would see the new flowers. And I really started to pay attention. So it, it sort of pulled me in on a deeper level to start focusing on, wow, look at the power of nature unfolding right in front of me. What are the analogies to life itself for me? And then sort of, you know, I could look forward with that hope and anticipation that hey, I'm going to be in the garden again. I'm going to be experiencing the beauty. And I would just go out there and have this meditative state where I'd look at everything, I'd be peaceful, I'd be comforted, and I just knew I'd be okay. And like Charlie and Michelle talked about, that healing, you know, that healing piece of the garden was there for me throughout my, my, my illness and then through my healing. 
And then the previous year I had to go and, you know, um, I had this breast cancer, I had it removed, they put an implant in, then my body started rejecting that. So then I had another surgery. So I went through another year, another summer in my garden and, and again, watching. And by that point, I'd already knew the analogies I would make. I knew that the garden was there for me. I looked forward to getting up every day. It just became a piece of me and offered me sort of, you know, this, um, this future path that I could see that I had seen in the garden. It was very parallel to my life. And it just gave me that refreshing and that, that uh, the journey to go to walk with, uh, to help me through it. Well, and the amazing thing, Jackie, is you are not alone and doctors are beginning to recognize this because they're actually writing actual prescriptions for gardening, are they not, Michelle? Yes, more and more. I think gardens, are, doctors are, are looking at nature and looking at gardening and garden. And you know, the first time I heard about a garden prescription was in London, England. And I was attending a horticultural conference and on the, the speakers list was the Queen's doctor. And I said, wonder what the Queen's doctor is doing here at the horticultural conference. And there he was, he stood up and he said, that his favorite prescription for the queen was gardening. Yeah. And yeah. I said, what? You know, like it really kind of, okay. And, and so that got me going. And so definitely part of the year of the garden is one of our goals is an aligning with the Healing Garden series. And every week we are gonna put out a garden prescription. We're gonna invite Canadians to do something in their garden, gardening, to make our lives better. Can you imagine if all, ev the whole world just spent 30 minutes in nature every day? I mean, you have, there's also the exercise component of gardening mm -hmm. too, right? Exactly. I mean, what that would do to our healthcare system, mm -hmm. what that would do to people's lives, get rid of the pills, <laughs> yeah. get into the garden yeah. and just spend time outdoors. Mm -hmm. Yes, from stress to, you know, like just being there and contemplating and being with and, and smelling and touching, mm -hmm. you know, it's hearing, it's, yeah, and hearing, and hearing it, the yeah. songbird. Right. I yes. mean, you can hear there, that's a huge component of it. Absolutely. And the, you know, the wind rustling in the leaves, yeah, all of it, water trickling, yeah. all these things are super calming. And um, yeah, no, it's, it, it is, it's, yeah. there's no magic bullet. I think that's, no. that's the difference. Like Western medicine has been all about take this pill, you know, call me in the morning if you don't feel better. And that's not what nature is all about. Nature is, is a prevent, it's really preventative. When we, when we spend time outside and we, whether we're in the garden or we're just walking and enjoying and being in the moment in the garden or in nature, uh, that's preventing problems. Yes. You know, that, like I said, is bolstering our immune system so that we won't become ill when somebody sneezes on us a week from now. You know, it's, it's quite interesting. Well, and Jackie, you have also spoken about your son who has ADHD. How has this impacted his life? Well, he loves being out in the garden and being out in nature. And he's realized it himself that when he's out there, when he's having, you know, a, a big emotion or uh, when he's feeling stressed, he knows that nature is his prescription. That if he goes out and he takes a walk, he's out playing in the forest with his friends, as long as he's going out and being in nature, he's able to calm down. He's able to focus a lot better. He's able to sort of just take a new breath of fresh air and be able to see all around him take that in and then sort of get back to a, you know, a better, calmer state. So for him, it's been, it's been a prescription for him, absolutely. I interviewed Jackie's son and uh, he was very funny. He, we were standing under a tree and trying to keep him from not climbing that tree <laughs> while we were having our chat was super hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. It's the meditative state. It's actually sort of being really engaged and being present. So the mindfulness piece comes into play for me. I understand that you actually feel that you can communicate with trees. That's a very dicey question now, Charlie, because I'm a scientist, mm -hmm. all right? There is a communication in nature and it's there and I am very interested in it. And it's like your dog or your cat. It's nonverbal communication. Mm. It's real. There is a compound in all flowering plants called gibberellum. And the structure that it comes from is the gibbe, molecular structure. When you talk to your plants, the gibbane structure increases. That's from my, my master's degree. The gibbane 
structure then adds things to it as a molecule and that molecule goes to flowering, goes to fruiting, goes to other structures in the plant and it forms the foundation for gibberellic acid and it is equivalent to one of the hormones in women and androgen in a man is very similar to this. Why does that increase? Charlie, I love that episode, for the record. It's the first time I've seen that. <laughs> it's super cool, and, and that'll be released uh, next year for, mm. for those that are listening and watching. Um, do you talk to your trees, to your Absolutely. plants? Absolutely, I always have, but it's not as uncool now as it used to be. So back you know, 20, 30 <laughs> years ago, I always made sure my cat was with me in the garden, so it looked like I was talking to the cat and not the plants. I thought, you know, <laughs> people are gonna be phoning, you know, getting me committed or something. But now, you know what, lots of people, Diana, you should have seen her, she was hugging trees like crazy. Yeah. And, and yeah, so I think we're... When and, you talked about those aerosols. And yes. the, you know, and so there is a real, so the biological connection between trees and humans is explored and you mentioned the Japanese practice of forest bathing. So what is a typical forest bathing experience, Michelle? Well, it, and we organize it in Ottawa on the garden promenade and, and basically it's spending that time with nature and with the tree and, and it's yes, touching, but it's, it's, just letting, absorbing the energy from the tree and realizing the beauty of it and, and being in the moment. You know, you have to let go of your cell phones and your tablets, you know, at that moment. You are there with the tree. And, and you know, we have native trees and, and there are a lot different kinds of trees and each one has a different energy and a different beauty. And it's spending that moment. So we have a coach, we have a person that takes a group and just takes them through the exercise of being with the tree. Is a walk outside as good as a forest walk? You mean a walk down the sidewalk sure. or something? Sure, yeah. No. No. No, No. you have to be in nature. Yeah, you need to, and it's and it's it's a form of meditation. So some people really work at meditating, and I didn't realize this, I wanna say, I've been meditating for 40 years, yeah. but yeah. I'm doing it all That's outside it. in the garden. Yeah. Because it is, it's like a be here now. Yeah. And and empty your brain, you know, like you say, phones are off, everything's off. And but just, do you have to be in Algonquin Park or no, can you be no. outside in your garden? Can you microdose? Oh, yeah. You yeah. can, yeah. you can. And you know what, for some people, it's not easy to get out into yeah. a park or, or a ravine. Yeah. And just a, a little fern in a pot, you and your fern talking to each other. And can you be. on your balcony yeah. gar garden to spend that moment mm -hmm. with your plants, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and can happen. Mm -hmm. and And even like for people that travel, you know, we talk about garden tourism. I mean, you know, the stress of traveling and the, why not visit a garden yeah. like Alexander Reefer, the Reefer yeah. Garden. Yeah. And by the way, Alexander is the chair of the Canadian Garden Council. Yeah. But you know, to, to, to go to a garden while you're traveling and spending that time yeah. is you rediscover that yeah. moment. Jackie, I mean, what is it about it for you? Uh, for me, it's the garden that, uh, you know, Charlie touched on it. It's the meditative state. It's actually sort of being really engaged and being present. So the mindfulness piece comes into play for me because I can, you know, look at something and, and start to see the beauty and I can be still because typically on a normal day, we're all in our minds. You know, we've got the to-do list. We've got this to do, go, go, go. And when I'm in the garden, when I'm out there, I can actually pay attention to the beauty, like how did this thing grow? Uh, look at one flower is completely different from the next. You know, how does it know to do that? And the stillness in the garden. And for me, it's all about engaging the senses. Um, in my garden, I have a little water feature, but I and I have, you know, I have evergreens, I have perennials, I have so many things in the garden um, that are blooming and sort of growing at different times. So I'm constantly engaging. I've got herbs, you know, that I'm, oh, tasting this and seeing how this is doing. I've got vegetables, I've got perennials, I've got flowers, I've got sunflowers, you name it. And for me, it's, it's that going and engaging my senses and getting me present in the moment. And it sounds like it's busy, but as I go from plant to plant, like Charlie was saying, it's this meditative state where I'm actually taking a look at the beauty, stopping, calming down, shutting my mind off and being present. And then when I come in, it's like I've refreshed. It's like somebody took my brain and all the things I had to do as a busy mom, as a work, whatever, you know, your, your daily day. And it sort of wiped it out a clean slate. So you come back in refreshed and renewed and you feel like, huh, I just feel different. I'm not sure why, but I know I feel calmer. I feel more, more better. I feel more hopeful. I feel more present. And in, just in, in general, just the well-being is, is key. I do want to go back to something that Diana was saying, which is that trees have similar hormone functions to humans. What does that mean for us? Well, 
Good question. This, we're, we're learning. Um, I spoke with a scientist recently from the University of Guelph, and he's a plant scientist and a microbiologist, and he said some of the things, like, just because we don't speak plant doesn't mean plants don't speak. Mm. And it's the arrogance of, human, arrogance of human beings that has assumed that we're the top of the food chain and everything is out there for us to use. And what, you know, people, what scientists are learning is that there's an awful lot more going on it, up above ground between the plants and below ground between the plants. Sharing of information, sharing of nutrient, crazy stuff. Like a, a pest uh, um, attacks one tree and all the trees around it start to produce a preventative Chem chemistry to save themselves from that pest. How do they know? Because the one that got attacked told them. How did they tell them? Nobody we really don't knows. Know. But they're, they're really working on it, trust me. Now, this is really interesting. By 2050, 66% of the world's population will live in cities. Yes. Right? So what does that mean for the healing properties of gardening and trying to get it out to people that live in urban centers? And, and in fact, gardens are, you know, like nature coming in your backyard, right? And so cities is where we pile one on top of the others. And, and when I look at these high rise and, and, you know, like I always say, does the balcony allow people to have plants on them? Because a lot of high rise says no plants on the balcony because there's water dripping or the weight. So we have to think differently. And so we have to bring nature into the cities. We talk about tree canopies and that, but gardens are a way of doing that. Gardens bring that nature to your backyard, to your balcony, brings it inside the house. And so, yes, people are living in cities. How do we bring that nature into the cities? And this is why the year of the garden is so important because it touches every Canadian. You know, the, the, the research shows that 83% of Canadian households are into gardening. 83%. So let's celebrate that and let's enhance it. Yeah, build and let's on it. get yeah. the whole family into it so that, yeah, maybe mothers into it or fathers into it. Like, no, let's get everybody into well, there's it. There's some pretty innovative architecture in Europe. Yes. Where they're actually <laughs> building condominiums or high density housing, but the, uh, the architecture of these buildings is designed for trees to be part of the walls, but it's all designed in. And if I could just say, that's why at the Year of the Garden, one of the things we're asking cities, municipalities, is to proclaim 2022 the Year of the Garden in their municipality and to commit to being a garden-friendly city. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Toronto was the first city to do it. Very Unanimously, good. the council agreed that 2022 is the year of the garden in Toronto, and they commit to being a garden-friendly city. So we want every municipality in Canada to do it. Yeah. Why not, yeah. right? All right, well, you know what? This will be a first step in getting them on board. <laughs> All right, when we come back, we'll get to your questions. That's next. Our call to action for the year of the garden is live the garden life. Welcome back. Well, it's been a while since we've had a live studio audience, but in this case, everyone is participating remotely and we are so thrilled to have you guys here. So let's get to some of your questions. We'll start with Helena. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Helena from Oakville, Ontario. And uh, you've mentioned quite a few activities in relation to the year of the garden. I'm just wondering if there's any major events that we can look forward to. Thank you. We are not planning on any major event. The approach is that we want to promote everything that's out there and enhance it. And so we are reaching out to the garden experience side of the family, horticultural society, gardens, public gardens, and municipalities to organize their activities, existing activities, or they might do new ones. And we will have our call to action for the year of the garden is live the garden life. And so when you go to the Year of the Garden website, there will be the Live the Garden Life agenda. And there you will be able to see all the activities across the country that are available uh, to you. And so our approach is instead of creating a huge event, we want to promote all the events. So yes, Canada Bloom here in Toronto, but you know there are so many activities out there. And so we are in, in uh, cooperating and collaborating with the Garden family to highlight all of the good work they are doing and promoting all the good work that they are doing. And there's always my radio show every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. 7.40. <laughs> 
And there's, you will be highlighting activities right. of the year of the garden, right? That's true. And, I will. Yeah, I will yeah, be highlighting that's activities. Right, that's so, right. yeah. and, you know, and and you can travel Canada's garden route and go yeah. to visit gardens. So there's already a lot of activities, and we just want to emphasize that, and we want to promote that. All right, Mary, you're next. Hi, this is Mary. I just moved from Oliver, BC, to Lethbridge, Alberta. And I have some roses of unknown sort in the backyard, and I have to transplant them. When should I do this? <laughs> well, honestly, the best time for cutting roses down, or transplanting, I should say, roses, is when they're dormant. So you could be digging them in the fall or, and moving them and planting them in their new permanent location, or you could wait till the early spring. Of course, where you're going to go is going to be full sun, minimum six hours of sun every single day, uh, where you're going to put them. You're going to make sure that the soil is in good condition. You've um, buffed it up, if you will. You've added organic matter. You've got to make sure it's a well-drained, fertile soil. Uh, and other than that, um, I would, not knowing how long they've been in that one location, it's hard to say whether you'll be successful. Point is, water them before you do any digging. And then when you're digging, get as big a root ball as you can possibly get to move with and keep that soil around the roots as best you can. Sometimes I use an old sheet or a piece of burlap just to keep the soil around the roots as I move to my next location. Back into the ground, of course, same height as where they were growing. So I should actually prepare a hole uh, this fall before the ground freezes. Yes. Uh, whether I'm going to move them in the fall or the spring. Yeah. Prepare your hole in advance for sure. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. You're Thanks, welcome. Mary. All right. And... Steve. All right, go ahead, uh, I'm Steve. I'm Steve Brightman in Port Dover, Ontario. Can you plant one bulb on top of the other? Because once you've covered it over with soil, you don't know where the bulb is. And what do you do after it's done flowering? We never know where the bulbs are until they emerge above ground. And then you're right, later you want to plant something and you want to not dig up your bulbs by mistake in July or August when they've gone completely dormant. Um, so that can be a bit challenging. It's not the end of the world. If you do dig up a tulip by mistake, a tulip bulb, you just stick it back on the ground and keep doing your other planting. So bulbs on top of each other, we don't normally do, though we just did that in that container garden we created. Um, normally in the ground, you'll, you'll um, there's different ways to plant bulbs. I don't like them when they're done with a slide rule, like everyone is four inches apart. I like to make them look very natural. I like my bulbs to look like they just naturally grew in, in you know, fields of, of tulips or daffodils or whatever the, you know, the, the look might be. Um, and once they're finished flowering, of course, cut off the spent flower, leave the leaves alone. They will slowly but surely turn yellow and die down. But let that happen naturally. Yes, the energy goes back into the bulb, and so as soon as you see that flower starting to fade, cut it off and let it get yellow. The and, leaves. And then the, the leaves and everything else, and then the energy will go back into the bulb. So you'll have and big the flowers the yeah, next year. The following right. year it's yeah. going to bloom again. Right, and it's not pretty, tulips particularly, as they're turning yellow, they look pretty ragged in the garden. Yeah. I try to have something grow up over my, my not-so-pretty foliage of my bulbs. So it could be coral bells, it could be daylilies, it could be whatever. Grows up over and covers, up, covers over that foliage as it's dying down. Thanks, Steve. When we come back, final thoughts from our panelists. <laughs> Welcome back to the Zoomer. It's time for final thoughts from our panelists. So we'll start with you, Michelle. Well, I'd like to invite everyone, every Canadian, to live the garden life. You know, 2022 is the year of the garden, and we've talked here about all the benefits of, of gardening and gardens, and, and our call to action is live the garden life. If you're living the garden life, you're living a healthy life, you're living an environment-friendly life, you're having an impact, and you're creating quality of life for you and your community. So folks, it's easy. You can live the garden life and you can visit our website, Gardens Canada or theyearofthegarden.ca and we will coach you on how to live the garden life in 2022. <laughs> I love How's it, that? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, I mean, what, you know, something people don't always realize is that everything starts with plants, absolutely everything. So when you mentioned the indigenous people of, of uh, North America, yeah. everything was plant-based. Yeah. Or, or, or Because think about it, clothing, cotton, flax, you know, linens, all these things were from natural products. 
obviously animals provided fur, et cetera, et cetera. But what did the animals eat? It start, they ate bunny rabbits that ate plants. Like everything starts with plants. So people just recognize the importance of plants, support plant growth, and as you say, live the garden life. We're doing great things for the sustainability of the planet when we do these things. We're doing good things for ourselves and our neighbors. Growing our own food doesn't get much better because the best tomatoes and carrots are the ones you grow yourself. So, you know, and herbs, etc. So just dabble, have some fun, do be successful, and you'd be amazed how much you'll get the bug and want to grow even more. Jackie? I think the biggest thing for me with this is just get involved in, in some sort of gardening. I think one of the things, you know, when I talk to people across the country, it's like, where do I start? What do I do? Just start with one plant. Start with a plant that maybe, you know, invokes a memory of that you grew up with that your mom or dad had. And, you, you know, um, when you were gardening a long time ago, if you were an elder, uh, wherever you are gardening, the gardening will meet you. And I think it, it, it involves everybody. Kids have so much fun playing in the dirt. The bacteria is good for them. Teenagers, you know, my son with ADHD, it's helping him, you know, just help them refocus. Mental health is huge. Um, and then my my own illness of having breast cancer and being in the garden and and you know looking forward to working in the garden and just being in the garden. So I think it's start. Don't be intimidated. Start with one plant. Have fun. Go out and find something that you're absolutely drawn to in the garden centers. Um, or go you know go to gardens and when you see a flower or a plant or whatever it is, evergreen, whatever attracts you, find out the name and start taking a little Google look at it and then come back to your space whether it's a balcony, whether it's indoor, whether you've got a small space, whether you're in the city and start gardening. And you're going to see why we gardeners call it our happy place. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, you know, the physical benefits, the manifestation of beauty um, and the mental health benefits as well. So start with one plant and enjoy it. All right. A big thank you to our virtual audience for being here all across Canada. Thank you so much. And to you at home watching and to my panelists, of course, for your expertise and for being here. That's all the time we have for now. It's time to zoom out.